County Board Workshop, December 3rd, 2019, Affordable Housing Opportunities and Resource Alignment. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I know that Mary Jo's on her way back, and that'll give us the opportunity to get around the room. I'm Tony Carter, Ramsey County Commissioner. We'll go around and come back to Mary Jo. Nicole Fretham, Commissioner District 1. Victoria Ranger, Commissioner District 7. Jim McDonough, County Commissioner District 6. Tristan Mattis Castillo, Commissioner District 3. We'll go around here, come back to Mary Jo, and then we'll go to the County Manager and introduce their White Controller, Health and Wellness Service Team. Maria Weatherall, Ramsey County Veterans Services. Chris Samuel, County Auditor Treasurer. Shannon Brandler, Secretary. Anya Dallas, Health and Wellness Admin. Community Account Health Officer. Carissa Glad, Public Health. Mary Lou Egan, Community and Economic Development. Martha Faust, Community and Economic Development. Michigan County Attorney's Office. Jane Catherine, County Manager's Office. So without, oh, and Mary Jo McGuire, County Commissioner, District 2. Thank you, and I don't want to take much time except to say that this is an exciting opportunity to share back on affordable housing opportunities and resource alignment in Ramsey County. There's much work that's been going on as represented in the packet that we have today. I would like to turn this over to the county manager, then introduce those who are here with us to present. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioners, exciting topic today that builds off of conversations that started I mean, I'll say they started during the budget process and then continued through it. I think they've been with us beyond the budget process, but they came, how about they came to the forefront through the budget process as a part of where our conversations lie and where to go. Although through the community-based economic development divi department division, as it started up, uh, the, the work in that space of thinking about the role in economic development, how we've heard even from Greater MSP, housing is such a key asset as a part of our region's ability to atta attract and retain talent uh, as we move forward. And then thinking about how that needs to intersect with our emergency services side of the organization where we know we are the safety net provider and counties provide roles in that space that there are, there are no other individuals or entities providing. Uh, in our commissioner-led discussion we had a few months ago, part of the follow-up was talking about you know, how do we think about our role across policy, funding, and programs without being duplicative and while doing the most good, I would say at a high level. How do you have the most bang for your investments across those different areas? We've spent a lot of time working through this. Um, Carrie has spent a ton of time thinking about timelines and statutes requiring different movements. And then we need to think about all this in the context as well of last week's budget hearing and the entire conversation of compounding levy impacts and what does it mean on the communities we're trying to serve. And the pernicious side of property taxes where in one attempt to help, you can make uh, housing more unaffordable in another way. And that's just a piece that's been a dynamic for us as we think about this work. I'll leave the rest of the workshop, but I hope this helps to further our direction that goes beyond even 2020 into 2021 and beyond. And I'm going to go straight to Carrie. All right. Thank you so much, Andrew. Andrew, if you'll introduce the other sure. person. I'm Carrie Collins. I'm a Community and Economic Development Director. And I'm Max Holders. I'm the Interim Manager of Housing Stability and Health and Wellness. And I'd just like to say that um, what a unique opportunity to be partnering with Max on this so that we can start to look at the whole, the full housing continuum, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and Joanna. Uh, Joanna Burke, Deputy County Manager. Mm -hmm. And I think, Will, in the interest of time, let's just go straight to, to Carrie. Um, so I, I'd just like to start off and add that this, this presentation was uh, put together. Max and I worked on it. Uh, but Chris Samuel was also uh, a key uh, partner in this as well, uh, and he knows uh, this stuff in and out. So if there are any specific questions about tax collection, he is here and, and available. <laughs> um, we have uh, been talking about affordable housing throughout 2019, uh, as county manager alluded to. We talked about it uh, <laughs> most specifically uh, this past September, which led us here to, to, to today. However, we started 2019 with having a thoughtful conversation around affordable housing, and Max led that presentation. Uh, we've talked about it as a key component within our economic development workshop. 
It has also uh, been a huge priority in our major redevelopment projects, uh, and it has led us to carve out a strong piece of our economic competitiveness and inclusion vision plan, which we'll undertake in 2020. A big piece of that will be a housing assessment, which allows us to understand what our housing inventory is in Ramsey County, uh, you know, what type of product are we missing, what types of services are we missing, uh, and better understand where we can better align resources moving forward. Uh, so during September 17th, uh, we had a commissioner-led discussion on uh, affordable housing, and thank you. And uh, at that time, we identified uh, some some funds, and there's an RDA that's working through the system for uh, mid-December uh, that includes a partnership with the NOAA Impact Fund that will allow us to uh, play a stronger role when it comes to preserving uh, naturally occurring affordable housing. Uh, but we also need to talk about what our role is going to be generally when it comes to affordable housing, both on the service side and supply side, uh, and so we can walk through that. Let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, the housing continuum and where county the county currently has programming and services. So this graphic is really a broad depiction of what a housing continuum is. The county doesn't play a piece in each thing that's bolted here. For example, Section 8, which I would actually put into subsidized housing rather than supportive housing, is administered by both the Met Council in the suburbs here and um, the public housing authority in the city. So we we'll, won't we'll discuss that one today. But as we see, we move from emergency housing on one side, and really that starts with unsheltered folks who are outside camping, um, living in caves, living in lean twos, and that where we participate there is through our outreach contracts. And um, into the, moving into the future, we also hope to participate in the cleanup and abatement and how those two interact. Um, and then we also participate in um, through the funding of shelters, both um, direct contracts to a shelter provider, but also through um, our the funds that we administer through Heading Home Ramsey as well. So we think about Catholic Charities' major footprint in downtown St. Paul, the safe space um, that's on the emergency housing side. On the yes, go ahead. And I'm not the words refer on this board. Yeah, mm -hmm. but what you just said, and our, what I was going to call this out, and I really appreciate you said it. Instead of homeless and shelters, I really think we need to just say unsheltered and sheltered. Mm -hmm. They're both homeless. Yeah. There's different approaches, mm -hmm. but we d you mm -hmm. said it exactly what it is: sheltered and unsheltered, and we mm -hmm. need to call it out really clearly so that we're everybody really understands here. There isn't a difference yeah, between homeless problems. and shelters, mm -hmm. yeah. and but there is a difference between unsheltered and sheltered. Thank you. And we see that tension between the two and helping people you know, go from unsheltered to shelter is kind of that first step along the continuum as well. So. Um, and then as we move into supportive housing, we can think of this as our um, um, housing support or GRH, um, transitional housing, um, housing with services. So a lot of times we have, um, it's an apartment unit or a group setting that also requires, um, the individual requires deeper mental health or maybe they have a disability or maybe they're aging and that requires an additional level of services as well. So on this side of the continuum, we see about the county either making about $16 million in um, grant passed through funds administered by the county. So that could be a HUD grant, that could be our state FHPAP, that could be a housing support that we're administering. Um, and then we're doing a, we use about $1.6 million in levy on this side. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, we're leveraging a lot of um, grant capacity funding on this side. And then as we move into more of our subsidized housing units, so that could be um, rental subsidies. Um, and I, there's a, a lot of this can be made, but um, <laughs> um, subsidized housing as a, let's, we can call this rental subsidized housing in this area. Um, and that's, we can use our CDBG and home funds for some of this. It's a very small amount. So our total CDBG and home together is about $1.6 million, and not all of those activities are housing eligible. So not everything is going to be focused on housing up is $1.6 million. And some of that goes toward, leads to longer-term stability as well. So um, as we think about down payment assistance or weatherization of folks' homes as well. Um, I would say those are also subsidized activities, um, but they're more in that home ownership realm, which um, can lead to long-term stability there. And this isn't, uh, the goal of a housing continuum isn't to move everyone towards home ownership. It's to, um, to match what people's needs are and their affordability levels um, into the best location for them. So someone who has um, 
the deep need of services, their long-term goal is not going to be home ownership um, over the term of their life, maybe, but to make sure that they have a place that they can, um, they feel stabilized and they, they can afford would be long-term housing stability for them. Um, and so I want to call that out as we're not, uh, that our vision is not to move everyone to home ownership. And for some people, uh, just a market rate apartment would be really home ownership stable as well. Um, for others, um, yeah, and for myself, it would be to own a home eventually, so. So, two things, yeah. and you know, I'll put it up front, because one of the questions may call it out, I have not looked through the PowerPoint, <laughs> and so you might get to it, but, yeah, I mean, you called it out, why is Section 8 in support of housing when it really is a subsidized housing, because there isn't a lot of supports that go with Section 8, it really is subsidized housing. Yeah, I think it was just, I don't think there's, I think it just got just put in the wrong category, yeah. so I yeah. called it out right away. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, and I know this is like broad, right? Yeah. But, um, and I don't know if you get into it deeper, but you know, I look at rental subsidies and, and how we can use money and be effective, and right away you go to, you know, buying down rents, and that can be really costly, but there's some really um, inexpensive ways of subsidies, like just landlord guarantees have proven mm -hmm. really effective, right? You know, are we getting those deeper lists of what various levels of subsidies might look like and what we can actually buy with dollars and help us weigh in the decision making of where to put dollars. Um, because, you know, there are some things kind of looking backwards that are always kind of the goal of two things, but looking forwards, I think, you know, we've got to get as great as we can to the question. I think we want to, to, to build off that question. I think one of the things that prevents people from moving them from this continuum is the barriers. And we've talked about that before, whether yeah. that's incarceration, no, income, um, mental health, they have an eviction from a previous apartment, all those types of barriers can help prevent people from moving through this. And so there are programs that we're dabbling with now, for example, Beyond, Beyond Backgrounds, which is yeah. offering a la landlord guarantee for taking someone who has additional barriers. Um, if those prove to be successful, the, that might be an area of expansion that might be um, more cost effective than a uh, rental subsidy voucher yeah. or something. Yeah. Like that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Commissioner Randall? And I know that we're going to get into the naturally occurring affordable housing. <coughs> but I think that that is something that is not, you know, an individual subsidy, but something that um, brings more value to the community as a whole mm -hmm. um, and how we can support that. So. I do that. Yes, Commissioner. Because I think that that's a really important piece of this because so much of our affordable housing is actually naturally occurring and right. it's not just mm -hmm. the big apartment complexes right. that the NOAA fund, it's really the housing in the east side, Frogtown, mm -hmm. North End that um, becomes affordable by default, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And mm -hmm. most of that, unless you've got a really responsible landlord, so much of that is not livable conditions. Right. And yeah, we, we check a box and we think we've got people living in affordable housing, but if we don't recognize that one of the biggest problems we have is we have a huge population living in substandard housing, mm -hmm. rodents, mm -hmm. mildew. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I could, I just, I, I, an east sider, a good friend of mine, was renting and he, he wanted to actually find a cheaper place to rent so that he could <coughs> save money to buy a, a down payment for a house, right? Not very sophisticated, didn't, didn't grow up with a dad to help him figure things out, so he, he found a cheaper place to rent, right? Didn't realize it, but there was no furnace in that house. The mm. landlord put electric heaters in every mm. single room, right? He mm. gets his first Excel bill in December and it's like $2,300. Mm. So this poor guy who's trying to do the right thing, and he ends up, you know, Oh, way more overloaded. So, you know, when we talk about NOAA housing, yes. there's two types of NOAA housing. There's the quality, affordable, that we need to protect and preserve and grow. And there's this huge yeah. stockpile of Something. miserable that none of us would live in and we shouldn't expect anybody to live in. We need to have conversations about strategies. And that. So that's, that's actually that. what I was <laughs> yeah, <laughs> referencing too is, um, yeah, you can't. Just because there's a, a roof over the head doesn't mean that it's um, uh, a place we would want to live. So particularly as we get to the normal housing, we'll talk about quality, affordable housing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you. Um, so thank you. I, I think as we head into existing programs on the supply side, I will just echo those comments and, and say what you just demonstrated is that there's substantial need in all sorts of aspects along the continuum. And, and you know, just from developing affordable housing, it, it takes between eight to ten funding sources to make it happen, and that's just on the, the unit supply side. And, and then all of the need when it comes to you know, naturally occurring affordable housing for both single family homes and rental. There's, there's just so much work to be done. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, just kind of a refresher on our existing programs, as Max suggested, we do get about 1.6 um, in federal entitlement funds, both between the community development block grant funds and the home funds. And so this talks a little bit about how CDBG can be used for housing. However, it's not necessarily a housing program. It is supposed to be intended to use to facilitate affordable housing, but it also can be used for infrastructure uh, repair. Uh, it can be used for job creation. Uh, really, it's intended to you to be to serve uh, entities in low-income census tracts, or uh, serve a organization or a company that has a low-income clientele. So that can be any number of things. It does, um, at times, can be used for naturally occurring affordable housing. Uh, and so we try to kind of broaden the use of CDBG funds. Thanks. Um, thanks. On the CDBG funds, if we are you know, receiving funds and can be used in multiple um, ways, do we have an internal policy on like buckets that we're going to demonstrate? How is that decided from Ramsey County side? We are required through HUD um, to put together our, um, our five-year plan and that you know, indicates priorities and goals, and um, I believe, I'll look to Mary Lou, but that does get approved by the HRA. The five-year plan itself doesn't get approved by the HRA, but each year there's an action plan that's part of that, and that gets approved by the HRA about what's going to be spent each year. And then moving on to home funds, that is intended to facilitate supply, um, however, uh, being as though of the 1.6, 1.2 is in the CDBG bucket, bucket or so, we get four to five hundred thousand dollars a year to use for affordable housing, and that, as we know, uh, doesn't go very far. Um, however, we are able to, you know, add additional units here and there for projects that are happening. Uh, I, I want to stress that the the CDBG and home uh, are can only be used in suburban Ramsey County. St. Paul gets their own CDBG and home allotment. Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. we're kind of restricted as far as what we can do in the state hall. Go back. <laughs> uh, okay, so assuming that we eventually get um, housing in uh, our Mills property, does this mean that, and not that we would, I'm just trying to understand the last, the last line there. So because we own it, none of the funds could be used to for housing on the property because we own it. No. No. Okay. No. I think Mary Lou, oh, you okay. can express yeah. this, but um, it can't be used for a public facility. It's oh. Yes. Okay. So you can't use it to build a public library or, you know. You can't be oh, self-serving. a property that we're going to use. Okay, yes. I thought yeah. it was that we own the property and therefore we could, okay, gotcha. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my apologies, but and I know you're, you know a lot of this, but I just want to make sure as we're moving forward on this that we're getting into, again, looking forward and not looking backwards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on the down payment assistance for first-time home buyers, this is one area, again, where I think we because, and I'll, I'll tell you the story of my son, right? I mean, he was paying $1,300 a month for him and the money to rent a two-bedroom apartment. I helped him with a $8,000 down payment. He got a townhouse that they both could go live in and taxes insurance and mm -hmm. principal was $800 a mm -hmm. month. He saved $500 a month, wow. right? But it's not just the down payment assistance that can really help families out. It's they, a lot of families that are in this situation bump up against a credit score or a barrier to get that mortgage. And it just kills me every day the way people are paying 12, 1300 bucks renting. And right now in this market, they could actually own something and pay a lot less. And so it's not just the down payment assistance, but how can we really help some of these folks get in 
I don't know what a guarantee looks like or how do we help with credit scoring issues mm -hmm. on the barrier to get the loan, but that opens up huge, again, trying to you know benefit as many people as possible with the limited money we have, the limited exactly. resources, and to me that's an area that we really thought that through a little bit more to really open up a lot of doors for individuals. Yeah. Commissioner McDonald, I'll, I'll just respond and then just say when I worked um, more closely with the current population in Southeast Roseville, uh, the Brittany Marion Apartments, which is home to our, one of the largest refugee pop populations, uh, was subpar housing, as you mentioned, yeah. um, and, and still is. And they're shutting it down. And, they're, they, and they, they, <laughs> they took their license. Took their license. They took their license, <laughs> to they took their license um, and so that they can make those improvements. Um, working with the International Institute in Resettlement Services, it was a really hard balance, as you mentioned, yeah. because refugees coming in, they have to develop credit. And so oftentimes, in, unless you have a credit score, uh, they won't take you. And that was one of the few places where mm -hmm. we would take them. And so it's it's kind of balancing those places. But I think you're absolutely correct in that, you know, what types of guarantee programs, what kind of what kinds of things can the county play to reduce that risk up front uh, is an important piece of the conversation. As well as financial literacy is embedded part of the work that we do. Um, at this point in time, if you want to take the 11 by 17 that, that was included, if you have it, um, otherwise there's there should be an 11 by 17. Oh, it looks like you've got an 8 half by 11. Yeah, if not, oh, okay. okay. But I'll just talk about the kind of the highlights here from um, this table from the Minnesota Housing Partnership. Uh, they've identified uh, key funding partners at 30%, 30 to 50% AMI and 50 to 60 percent AMI, the full continuum of housing. And I just kind of pulled out the highlights. Um, counties are identified as a necessary funder, both as a capital funder, a service funder, and a rental assistance and operating funder across every continuum with the exception of 50 to, uh, or 60 to 80 percent. Uh, and this, this just goes to show exactly, um, commissioners, what you described as far as the need for many, both cities and counties, and Met Council and nonprofit agencies, Minnesota High and Housing Finance Agency, to be a part of this larger collective that helps to facilitate services and supply across all of those stops of AMI. Uh, I think it's it's a really good illustration of that. Uh, so if you need an 11 by 17, there are some going around here, but I think um, this is just kind of the general macro level idea of who should be involved at each stop along the way with the goal of the 2020 vision plan and the housing assessment to drill down to say who are the players in Ramsey County and where are we missing when it comes to all of these AMI ranges. Now you've seen this before for other purposes, um, however, let's talk a little bit about levy authority and what that means for Ramsey County. I think this was not necessarily um, well understood when I first arrived, and it certainly was news to me uh, that Ramsey County had an HRA levy authority but just historically has not levied. Uh, this is an important piece of the narrative because our peer counties are levying. They are loving for affordable housing, they are loving for economic development, for redevelopment efforts. Some have county-owned housing, some levy throughout several different levy authorities, and we have been absent. And uh, so the programs that we can offer are limited to the federal entitlement programs and then the grant programs that are coming through health and wellness as well. Yep. Yep. And as you think about how the absence of a levy from Ramsey County, there are absent matching opportunities as well. I don't recall seeing those outlined here, but is that the work that you're doing as we look forward to the vision plan? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Commissioner Reinhardt and then I just wanted to comment that I think it's important because you, you said it already, but I want to repeat it, is that we already have that authority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the EDA that we were looking at at the legislature required additional legislation mm -hmm. um, and the ability to uh, levy under that. But right now, we have the authority under today, right. under this. 
Thank you. Ms. McGuire. I thank you for that um, clarification, Commissioner Reinhardt, because I was just going to ask the question if we're, and maybe you're going to come to this, you know, are we thinking of going for EDA or, you know, authority or, you know, where where, where are we at with that with our city? So you're going to Let me just advance the slide. Should, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thank you. So CD suggested approach activate neutral levy and why is that? Uh, so, as Commissioner Ryan Hart mentioned, there was an attempt several years ago to seek special legislation for an economic development authority. And the intentions were spot on, I think, in the absence of a very formal uh, program outline, it caused some skepticism from our city partners. And if that was an, you know, an important piece, because it did require all of the cities to opt in at that time. Uh, there was enough, uh, you know, miscommunication, misunderstanding throughout that time uh, that the county decided to withdraw that request and, um, you know, led to a number of efforts to get economic development to kind of better aligned. Uh, so at this time, um, now that we kind of understand, you know, the, the world that we're living in right now is that we are in an affordable housing crisis and we have an HRA levy that's, that's currently um, within our authority to activate. There are some nuances to that that we'll discuss in a moment, uh, but our suggested approach is to, there's enough to do. There's clearly enough to do to align resources uh, for affordable housing and redevelopment. Uh, redevelopment's a key piece of this because Ramsey County is a fully built out uh, county. We don't have a lot of green field, we don't have a whole lot of undeveloped land, uh, even in terms of Rice Creek Commons, that's redevelopment as well. Uh, there are existing buildings on there. So, uh, we are a fully redeveloped community, uh, which means that when we go to activate an HRA, that we can use it for both affordable housing and for the removal of blight and to help you know, aging commercial corridors or to help our businesses that are in need of a facelift. Uh, and so there's a lot that you can do to activate the HRA levy. Um, as demonstrated through Minnesota Housing Partnerships uh, Housing Continuum, uh, it takes both cities and counties working together to make a dent in affordable housing, along with our partner organizations. Uh, we need to have program offerings that either complement <coughs> what cities are doing or fill a gap where there are missing services along the full spectrum. Uh, there's a levy authority in place for most of suburban Ramsey County. We'll talk a little bit about the communities that, are, that would be exempt to this. That's a big piece of the conversation. Um, the goal is to activate the levy authority that exists, keeping in mind that an economic development authority uh, does have the most flexible use of funds. And you can use it for affordable housing, you can use it uh, for uh, business attraction and retention and expansion, which is why uh, it's typically the most desirable type of authority. Uh, but that's something that we believe in community economic development should be our long-term strategy. But just using the authority that we have right now, building out the programming with the vision plan really steering our direction, uh, there's there's plenty to do right now in the short term. Um, May I call on Pat? Thanks, Madam Chair. So let me just try and restate this part a little bit more as we dive into it. So the goal today was to develop a suite of options along a continuum to discuss with the board of potential paths forward that are both realistic under the statute and also address issues related to timeliness, uh, likelihood of you know passage, moving it forward. We don't have, there's not one magic perfect area. This was actually the most challenging part to build out for this workshop. And at the same time, I think what Carrie's trying to say is, so there's gonna be three ideas here. We do have a preferred staff approach that tries to balance those needs and weighs them, but um, that's the evaluation piece we're gonna walk into on the coming slides. So um, this is a little text heavy, but I wanted you to understand the full extent of what a HRA can be used for housing, affordable housing, redevelopment, it's really for the reduction of blight. Um, and so, you know, there is a blight test um, and, you know, there's plenty of cleanup and redevelopment opportunities that, are, that our cities would love to pounce on if there were funds available to do that. Um, so Ramsey County by the numbers, uh, and then we'll talk about a little bit of the timing. Um, now, before we get into this, there are exempt communities from our HRA, and the, the, the year threshold is 1971. 
Uh, right now, we would have the authority to activate our existing Housing and Redevelopment Authority at a percentage of 0.0185 per statute. Uh, and we would be able to do that for those communities uh, that created an HRA after 1971. Mm -hmm. The communities that have uh, HRAs that we are aware of include the City of St. Paul. So that is 50% of the of Rams County tax base. Uh, North St. Paul, New Brighton, uh, the records are unclear at this time, uh, and White Bear Lake. Uh, so if we looked at what, what does that mean, uh, you know, building out the 2020 vision plan and getting the city of St. Paul to, to partner with us, uh, that would mean about ten and a half million of, of levy dollars. Without the exempt cities and a suburban HRA levy would be about 4.2. So you said that those who created before 1971 could be exempt or would be they exempt? They could be. They could be exempt. They, could be, they would need to um, opt in, right. essentially. And then are there any who created HRAs after 1971, mm -hmm. which should be on this list, and they are not exempt? So they would have their HRA and could, and would also be covered by an HRA, by our HRA. Absolutely. I think most cities in uh, Lansing County do have some form of HRA or an EDA. Um, and so this would essentially complement mm -hmm. uh, what they can, what they can do. Um, so if they have an, an EDA, does that exempt, I mean, are they considered one and the same as far as exemptions? That's my first question. Okay. So if they have an HRA, um, well, we've got those that are exempted. So, or could be, I should say. Um, if they choose not to opt in, um, so they don't, uh, I live in White Bear Lake, I wouldn't be charged the levy. Um, does that mean that only the communities that opt in get any money? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mission is the skill, and then I just want to like talk through that a little bit more because in this case they would have to choose to opt out because they're in, right? Is that how it they? Means? It would be a choice to opt out. But let's say St. Paul opted out; they didn't want to be part of it. Then, um, or they stayed in, right? We love being in St. Paul. Can we spend the money in St. Paul, even though they have their own HRA? Yep. So for clarity. Um, <laughs> so, those, those communities uh, that are exempt would need to take formal action by mid-year July of, we'll say, 2020 or 2021, we'll talk about timing, and they would need to formally opt into this levy. Um, those communities um, don't need to, that currently have HRAs created after 1971. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to make a, pass a resolution of of support, uh, they wouldn't be able to opt out. Okay. And for those communities that um, are either participating because we suddenly activated or choose to participate, uh, those dollars will be spent in those communities. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yep. So the our current, and that's just the levy dollars because we have the federal funds that would continue to be used in just the suburbs because St. Paul has its own allocation of those funds. I can get really messy. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as which yeah. funds yeah. would which be funds used where? Yeah. Well, these funds would not be commingled. Right. right. Yes. I get yes. 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 Yeah. <laughs> but all of the funds collected from a levy that Ramsey County would levy, for example, St. Paul, would have to be used in St. Paul? Is that what you're saying? No, uh, no, it, okay. so it goes into the larger pot, so the 10.5. And, and because St. Paul is 50% of the tax base, you would certainly want parity between how you're using those funds to ensure that St. Paul is, yeah, no, no. Mad Madam Chair, just on clarity, but if, if a city opted out, we would not create a freeloader problem where right. they would then receive levy funds in their community from an HRA levy when they were not having their residents contribute to it. So it's more on the negative side to it mm -hmm. that becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, we haven't done all the language yet? <laughs> Go ahead, Jen. <laughs> we're, we're just <laughs> testing the language here. Go ahead. Um, but I think eyes wide open. 
um, the more folks that are a part of this from the get-go, the better, mm -hmm. right? And part of this is kind of driving trust and relationship. Mm -hmm. There's going to have to be some understanding. Everybody's benefiting from what they're putting into the mm -hmm. pot as we develop mm -hmm. the trust and relationship about broader and bigger uses moving forward. Mm -hmm. And so part of that is going to be recognizing that at least for the type of whatever we would choose to do and how successful we're at it is recognizing that communities that are, especially the ones that have the choice, mm -hmm. are going to need to feel like they're going to get their share back. And then we build the trust moving forward that eventually it's a countywide piece that is responsive to all the communities as issues arise. Mm -hmm. Commissioner McDonough, if I might respond to that, that's why the vision plan is so critical mm -hmm. to this conversation, because the housing assessment is one thing to understand housing by the numbers as far as the matrix, matrix that we've discussed before as far as who's doing what, but also our city partners are going to be a huge part of the engagement piece of this vision plan in helping us define and refine recommendations as far as how future funds will be used. So it should be no surprise as far as how these funds will be used, and it should be no surprise that, that a levy option is, is what will come out. Okay, Commissioner, okay, I'm trying to um, just make sure I understand this. So if a community, um, we, uh, for example, if a community doesn't want affordable housing in their community, they would maybe opt out of the having this because because they don't want any dollars to be used in their community for any of these types of work. Or the community, the city is still zoned for this stuff, right? So we can't do anything in a community, even if we have the right to and we're living in their community and everything. We're still working with that community with their zoning and everything to put this in, right? So if the community doesn't want something to happen, it. it, it they can zone their way out of it, even though they're a part of the levy, or no? Mm -hmm. There are, are the only uh, entities that could opt out are the ones described. Okay. Um, right. uh, theoretically, uh, they we will have it, you know, identify all sorts of programs. I, I would say, from my perspective, most cities will be chomping at the bits to find resources to help alleviate the pressure on the cities to front, to gap out a lot of those programs. Um, you know, if there's a, a community that doesn't want to take advantage of, of the programs, then that's, you know, up to them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say most communities will be, be easy one. Easy. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But I imagine that, I imagine that cities would want to use this tool to um, meet their projected um, affordable housing need, or as suggested by the Metropolitan Council as well. So. Uh, so I was going to suggest, oh. Carrie, if you go into this, yeah. ideally, we could maybe lay out all three because your last slide has some implications <coughs> on timing about why. And if you can get through the four slides, I think it helps. I made the mistake of not letting her get through them when We're I did this. So I'm trying to that. learn from my own mistake on this part. Thank you, Nicole. I'm sorry, Commissioner Freckham. I, I just had a question about what role cities would play in helping us determine how to use those funds more formally or informally. Uh, so there will be an implementation aspect of the vision plan and uh, with, with very tangible recommendations that then go into uh, program creation. So then the idea is that the county in partnership with, with the city partners develop what programs make sense because m most of the communities have an HRA or an EDA. Uh, they won't want us to necessarily duplicate those programs and if they, or they might because their funds only go so far. And we want to understand what the needs of each community are. Ramsey County, the needs are so different depending on where you're at. And so uh, we won't be able to necessarily tailor a program for every community, but to hear where the greatest, greatest needs are, they will be at the table helping to define those. Thank you. We're going to let you get through this. OK, thank you. <laughs> All right, so we've uh, identified some timing. Uh, so in the, in the event that the board uh, has consensus on this direction, the most aggressive approach would be that uh, those communities mentioned, so St. Paul, um, North St. Paul, and uh, White Bear Lake, and maybe New Brighton, uh, would need to opt in by, by July 1st of 2020, so six months away there. Uh, and the first HRA levy taxes would be collected in 2021. That is the most aggressive approach, and there are some concerns, and, and this should not necessarily come as a surprise, but 
the, the intent on the vision plan is to do a significant amount of engagement with our city partners to understand the needs of the community, to do a housing assessment, and we're looking at the 2020 being the year to do that analysis and to make recommendations with the goal of going around at the, at the end of 2020 with our commissioners to help the city councils understand what we learned. And I, I really see the value in that, leading us into the levy decisions. Um, Sure. Okay. The way I'm reading that and, and what I thought I heard you say don't jive for me. Um, so those communities that could be exempted, they have to choose to use that exemption, which is opting out, correct, rather than opting in? They will need to pass a, a resolution that uh, describes their intent with the HRA levy. So I think you can... So regardless, they have to, they have to do something proactively. It just yeah. doesn't... Okay, if you don't opt out, you are in? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. But the others don't have an option. Yeah, they we just move forward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the Let's talk about another timeline then. <laughs> <laughs> the, the concerns uh, also include staff capacity. Uh, with mm -hmm. increased programs, we're going to need additional staff. And I think it's, it's wonderful we have Max now in his interim role and we're starting to kind of build out this kind of housing piece, uh, but we're going to need to align staff around future programs and uh, how we spend those levy dollars. So um, it's the most aggressive. That is the most aggressive. So staff recommended is that we get through 2020 with the vision plan and we identify where the recommend recommendations are. Uh, that at the first quarter of 2021, we go around and visit all of our communities and give a presentation about the larger vision plan. Uh, and I think they'll be very interested in, in learning some of the data that we learn. Uh, and uh, then July 1st of 2021 is when those communities would need to say yes to the levy, with tax collection being uh, 2022. This is the most advantageous because we, it allows us to do the vision plan. We've done our engagement. We can better assess what staffing needs. Um, we'll need to partner with those resources. And then also it, it coincides with our budgeting process um, so that we can understand what this means for the larger community budget as well. Uh, just a little bit about EDAs too. I said it's the most flexible use of funds. I do think that this is should be the county's long-term strategy. And assuming we can activate the HRA and, you know, for, for all purposes, especially equity considerations, a countywide <laughs> levy makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, but then we can seek legislation, you know, as early as 2022 or 2023 to, to broaden the use of funds. But with the vision plan in hand, it, it, there will be no secrets as to how those funds will be used. And it might even be far more advantageous for our city partners to say yes, we actually have a lot of needs when it comes to all of these other programs, so you know, please partner with us on that. So um, I do still think that the EDA is the better option, and in fact, there are some communities that preserve both HRA and EDA authority for various reasons, um, but uh, that still is a big piece of this as well. Okay, so. Um, I'm trying to figure out how, we, because I can see communities if we if we go forward, and first of all, I think the, the staff recommendation makes the most sense, trying to rush something is what caused this problem the last time. <laughs> so, um, and even with HRA, because we had that discussion before too, what can we do and yeah. just going out and, and uh, just trying to not get all the, the information that we need with them. <coughs> But if we do the HRA and we're going for an EDA at the same time, um, are we, I guess my question is, are we better off um, just going for the EDA? And can we do any housing within the EDA? Do we need them separated or do we want to go with what we really want? Well, it depends on, on approach. Um, this is just, I mean, the suggested approach is the HRA because uh, yeah. the suburban communities, you just activate that levy authority. And we've certainly talked a lot about affordable housing in 2019 and to get them comfortable with that approach. Um, I, I, would, I really advocate for a staggered approach because I don't want to 
uh, resurrect old EVA feelings right now. Okay. All right. Yeah. That, that's the only piece I wanted to clarify, Madam Chair. Was yeah. it's not a it's not a at the same time layered approach. It's actually implement the HRA, have the vision plan in hand, but quickly then soon thereafter, and we're trying to be transparent. Open a dialogue with communities to say, we think there are opportunities to better support what you continue to tell us in this vision plan in areas where we're limited by the current tool. But now that we've built some trust and buy-in, we would like to do that collectively. And candidly, I mean, the concern of the EDA is one community could, in theory, create a challenge at the legislature for implementation. And so we just don't know if we've bought enough trust at this point to move down that road. And understand I, 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 um, I love how staff is very good at advocating for what they want and I want to just push back um, as we've laid out you know there's some we have concerns listed for the exact the aggressive approach but we don't have concerns about other approaches and I just want to raise one is that if we don't take the aggressive approach and I want to make sure everyone understands what that means is that before we're going to have any dollars ready to go for housing we're talking 2023 by going with the staff plan. So I just want everyone to know that that's what we're agreeing to, is that we you know, we know that we have this urgent need, but this is a long timeline. This is a slow, slow approach. And so I just want everyone to be comfortable with that and to call that out. Um, and, and in that nature, I would hope that if we're going with a staff recommended uh, longer approach, that at this time that we're, you know, um, putting the levy into effect, we're also doing a RFP for a proposal, so the moment we have money, we can get projects out the door, so we don't go to 2025 to get, so I just want to call yeah. that. Commissioner McDonough, on the yeah. wire, mm -hmm. or did I do it the so other After Trista's comments, I, to yours, you know, we've got, I think, a fair amount of trust with our suburban and all the cities, right? But we really stubbed our toe bad last time when we tried this. And so there's a lot of work to do to build the trust. Um, not so much that we can't get there. I feel we can really get there, but we've got to earn it a little bit. So, you know, doing the HRA in this recommended approach, I feel str strongly that that sets us up for that stage. And then staging the, AD, the EDA conversation to start once we've got got that demonstrated trust, we can start moving down that path fairly quickly. Just to your point, there's nobody on this board. I wish we had an EPA already, right? I really yeah. <laughs> and and it <coughs> me just to think that this um, recommendation is going to kick us out, you know, a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Two things on that. One, I go back to, we still got to earn the trust. Mm -hmm. But the other piece, and it's a part of this, and I was going to call it out, but the other big piece of this, and I mean, we just heard about it, you know, a month. If we bring in $10 million of new money, there's not a percentage increase in the HRA. Well, there is, but it's four to 5% increase in our county collection, right? That's a big hit for our taxpayers. And we got to be thinking, and I was, you know, Ryan, you know, how do we prepare our regular budget to be able to grab this opportunity and fill that void? But we can't go in with a 10, 12% increase the year we do this. We have to have time to prepare our budget so that that one year, that budget has paired, or the increase for that budget to support that budget. And all the work we talked about just an hour and a half ago doesn't get slowed down. We don't pause, but we don't, we can't overburden the people that are gonna be paying for all this in one year. And that's the other reason why I think, you know, just, Get, getting this right, moving too fast last time and really taught me that in this one, you know, some patience is going to pay off long term. The need is there now, but it's going to pay off long term one being successful. And I think we get to an EDA fairly quickly because all the trust happens in the vision, the end of the month, how we set this up. The HRA is just a stage to get the DED. But the biggest piece for me, and I think, you know, recognize around this table, what happens the year we implement $10 million in the money coming into this company? Mm -hmm. what is, what's the effect on the rest of the mm -hmm. okay. We gotta prepare for that, mm -hmm. we need that. Thank you, Commissioner McGuire. Thanks, and I'll just echo a little bit about what's being said, and I, I think we all wanna move faster on this, but for those of you that weren't here, and I, think, I know Trista, you were here for, you know, one of our cities actually passed a resolution against us doing this, so it was, it was, um, you know, uh, 
uh, it was hard then because it really helped, it hurt us getting any legislation done. And and so um, sometimes we do just need to be a little more patient. And we've all talked about how we want to move faster, you know, at these things. But I think right now I'll just echo that we. I'm, I'm going to trust our our staff because you. you Carrie, you know th these communities as well as anyone, um, what their appetite would be for this. And so as long as we can be ready, as just as, as Commissioner Manis Castillo said, be ready right when we need to be. Um, I think we do need to do it in a timely, in a timely manner. So, and then, you know, yeah. so thanks. And thank you. And I just want to push back. I know um, you said something about already having trust in our suburban communities, and I'll say a lot of my communities that trust is in there. Yeah. So it is going to take yeah. time to even build that trust with our cities and really fully invest in and understand their needs and how the county can actually be a communicative uh, partner for them to trust before we ask more of them. For that push break. And indeed the vision plan helps us to understand the needs that are out there and to get communication from those cities as well. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. And uh, you're having much of the same conversation we've had in the build up to today. And so I just want to acknowledge it's not a unique, it's not as though we're having uh, dissimilar conversations, at least in the run up. And, you know, I think in a, in a perfect world, even pushing toward July and putting in a lot of effort, um, if you're just looking at it through an economic development department lens, feels like it might be doable. And we may even be able to do that. And Carrie brings credibility to the work. And she's been working to build that with Ling and the rest of the. EGCI team and Max and his role and everything else. But when you layer in the budgetary consideration piece, um, that, that impact is real. And so I just want to be clear on the part of how we reach the recommendation we reached today is very much that consideration of, I don't have a good answer other than I would have to go back in the second year of the budget and make significant cuts to other parts of the budget to ensure that we are not unintentionally creating cost burden households while trying to build affordable housing. And, um, I just want to acknowledge how important of a conversation that is. And at the policy level in the state of Minnesota, I just think it's important to raise. We have made affordable housing such an expensive thing to build that in the context of raising funds to try and help people have stable housing, we're making it hard to build affordable housing. And I would actually ask that the one piece that's not in here that I think about in, in the legislative conversation, your role as leaders, one is we need your help in getting communities to feel comfortable, right? That's a role that we alone cannot carry. Uh, and the second part is, advocating at the state that as they see the movement the organization here is taking toward a timeline that's well thought out and trusted we need help we need investment we need policy change yeah. there's so many spots where it allows for other help to come in where I just think we need to we need to ask and continue to focus that on quality affordable housing because it is expensive um, the levers aren't there necessarily that we need and even so we need to ensure that what we are investing in is that quality and to just to say the obvious, and I really appreciate county manager's comments about legislation. And um, I know that actually um, Representative Houseman heading the, the Housing Committee actually has trusting Carrie um, uh, and and her team. And we just we, if, if we can get any proposals that I know this board would take us you know stand in support of, we should you know meet with her at least. We'd have her on board with what we want to do and see what we can do. So. I'm just putting it out there. I just want to highlight that do we that. have about 12 minutes oh, okay. until noon, which is when we're scheduled to come. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. One of the pieces that you talked about there, Ryan, was we've created a system where creating yeah. affordable housing is so expensive. Yeah. Right? That's why I was teasing off rent guarantees, mm -hmm. barriers, that, you know, felonies or mm -hmm. unlawful detainers. Where are the areas, you know, down payment assistance, but then do we go a little bit farther on how, how do we manage credit reports? Where are those areas where we can make affordable housing actually much more cheaper and be much more effective? So Trista, I agree with you. We gotta be ready that first dollars we collect, we know where it's going and it's getting out the door. But I also wanna make sure we spend this time thinking about, you know, how do we actually find ways to make affordable housing cheaper and, and, and just as effective, if not more effective, than kind of the traditional look back and how yeah. we've always done it versus how do we move forward. Because this is another opportunity where we haven't been in this game and we can bring a perspective to this when we're working on the visioning piece about 
not only where are the gaps in the cities, where can we strengthen where you don't have capacity, but where can we go in areas that you never were able to go before because these areas are so present for you right now, you're putting every penny there. And we've got an opportunity that we can go in areas that have never been explored in this county working with our citizens. And being ready for that day one, right? So that if that is not, it definitely needs to be a part of the vision plan. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I think this also echoes, you know, goes back to our conversation a couple weeks ago on our legislative platform is that, you know, we all need to make sure that we're advocating for additional resources and home and CDBG funds on the federal level and to make sure that's on our platform as well as at the state level, knowing that our timeline is out, that we need to have that effort and um, work put in in the front line to what fills the gaps in the meantime or in addition to, as well as, I agree, looking at our policies and where can we strengthen communities or cities that are doing 4D programs or tax programs and what does that really look like so that we can, in the meantime, so I think that's part of the vision plan and the work plan uh, to make sure that we're getting there. Thank you. I'm going to go back to you. This was just to kind of uh, summarize our uh, levy timing recommendations, and that was to you know, see through the, the vision plan, uh, really build up those relationships with exec, exempt communities so that they can understand the value of a uh, county HRA levy, uh, and then review HRA levy impact, as county managers suggested, against the 2022-23 budget, and then seek EDA special legislation um, you know, once we have an HRA levy impact and programs uh, underway. This has been a huge series of meetings that we've had this past year, leading to these recommendations. We've you know, seen a lot of nods around the table, uh, respectful of this staff recommendation. I wanted to ask what you need from us today in order to proceed, but also to check in first with commissioners around the table as you jump Well, I was just going to I don't I think what you need is direction about staff recommendation and being aggressive or something totally different. Mm -hmm. I'm really supportive of the staff recommendations. The one piece I would add to Trista's point on the vision piece as we're working with the cities is let's start from kind of a broader perspective and what strengths we can bring to that visioning process working with the cities. In the end, if we work, end up with the same old, same old to start, so be it. Let's try to start looking right. forward and broader than that. But I really, with all the sense of urgency more faster, I see this is the path to success. Yeah. And, Take care. and so are the yeah. other comments from Jane? Yeah, I would agree with the staff recommendation. I guess I would say the staff recommendation plus, and that plus would be the work for other resources from the state, the federal, um, mm -hmm. right? And, and looking at policies where we can make adjustments to make it affordable. So I would say staff recommended plus, plus my vote. Okay. <laughs> Any other I'm pluses? The commissioner right after me. Well, and I think that's good for next year's or I mean we have to we have to work at building the trust, not just decide <laughs> on January first, twenty twenty one that okay, now it's time to work on trust. So um, but but I do think um, we still have the, the funding that's coming up for the NOAA funding that's coming out of this year's budget. Um, mm -hmm. so and that's when did you say it was coming? December seventeenth. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Just support okay. the plus. So it, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't feel at all like entrenchment. It feels like having a solid plan to move forward on, uh, continuing to move forward, and DBA as we build trust based on our vision and work with our cities. So I want to say thank you on behalf of all of us for that concrete plan that you put before us. The nods around the table are to indicate that we are supportive of your plan plus. <laughs> so we look forward to the opportunity to talk about the plan and the blessings. Madam Chair, if I may just a, in closing, thank Carrie for the work she's done. I just want to say out loud here, the trust that has been rebuilt so far under Carrie's leadership is profound. And while we are not all the way to the end of that road, we have made significant progress there. And so I want to thank you and your, and your team for everything you're doing. I, I would echo that. Um, uh, people will come up to me that it's, it's not a, a subject matter that is being discussed at the time and talking about the work that's going on by carrying the team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
and that's what it takes to move forward. Right. Thank you so very much. No, all and, of you. Oh, and any time that we can get Alice Houseman to really appreciate uh, what the town is <laughs> We are happy about that. And Alice, uh, Representative Houseman, is uh, appreciative of the work that we're doing on this. So I want to just keep her posted on that. Thank you very much. We're adjourned. That was the